Hey everyone, and welcome back to Deeper Grooves, Musicians on Music, hosted by Cliff Beach and sponsored by California Soul Music Record Label. Today, I get to have my good friend who's done a lot of mixing work for us in the past, Tim Felton from San Diego, to talk about his record, Building Bridges, with the Shorefire Soul Ensemble, fresh off their San Diego Music Awards win. It's a number one billboarding debut album. Please help me welcome Tim Felton. This is Cliff. Yes. Hello, Tim. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm well, thank you. So I wanted to reach out. Glad we were able to actually take time to bring you on the podcast and have you uh, chat with us. I saw uh, that you guys have just won the San Diego Music Award, so that was super exciting. I listened to some of your other um, older records that we're getting into as well. Yeah, it was exciting. I didn't know. I went to your website that uh, Building Bridges also debuted on Billboard number one. Um, yeah. Which is amazing for an independent album and um you know obviously with coal mine but just in general i mean that's not uh that's not a easy feat so congratulations to that i just wanted Thank to you. kind of wrap my head around how uh this album came to be who worked on it and kind of what the differences are between uh some of your other records that you put out before sure well i guess um the main difference between this and, and the previous two is we had a we had a couple uh, personnel changes we have different uh, drummer and bassist. We brought in drummer Jake Nager, who's been playing all over California for like 20 years, and uh, bassist Omar Lopez. So they were new additions, and then we also um, added trombone player uh, Willie Fleming. So I guess to backtrack, what's what's your normal instrumentation just overall for the group for Surfire Soul Ensemble? Uh, the drums, bass, guitar, keys two percussionists, and three horns. So with the songs and everything that was on Building Bridges, like, um, like what was your kind of process of just creating the album? Well, it usually happens, you know, in, in rehearsals and at jam sessions. We, you know, we, we host these various jam sessions around town, and, and, and usually the songs start to take shape there. We'll, we'll, play, we'll play them out and... That's how usually how we develop the material, kind of li- live test it in front of in front of an audience and with other musicians. Some of these songs, it actually it actually took a while to get them onto record and released. Um, and we had been working on them with even older members who had been in the band. So it just you know it took it took a while. You, you know how it is. <laughs> I definitely do. And you record everything yourself, correct? Yeah. So I had spoken uh, on an earlier podcast with Sergio Rio from Oak Grown, who we worked with before. And, um, nice. you know, I think sometimes when you're recording yourself, it can be good, but it can also be difficult because you kind of have to be the one that, you know, says when to stick a fork in it. And when it's done, sometimes the process can be a little longer. Yeah, that's true. Your your ears start to get used, used to the way it, it's sounding. So you really have to be careful to take a break and try and come back at come back and listen to it with a with a fresh perspective so you don't make uh judgment mistakes or like you were saying um just work on it way too long (laughs) yeah so then when we talk about you know some of these accolades and how you created the record i mean how did you build up to be able to debut on billboard or or to win this um san diego music award like what kind of trajectory of like where you started only really a few years ago into where you are now based on this record. Coal Mine has really helped out a lot as far as, I mean, I'd say that they're the main reason that we debuted on Billboard, you know, just their label growing, other artists who who have attracted more attention to the label, like like Duran Jones and the Indications. Um, They probably put the, I'd say they put the label in the, the national spotlight more, more so than it was with like articles in Rolling Stone and whatnot. So, so being with that label definitely helped with, with, with the, the billboard accolades. Um, as far as San Diego music awards, this is actually our, every album has won a San Diego music award. So we're pretty grateful to be honored, honored like that locally. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's not easy to get respect, uh, in your, in your home base. So that's always good that that exists. And it's there. So, yeah, definitely love Terry and the crew all over at Coal Mine. And they've done so many great records with um, with Orgone and Neil Francis and 
uh, the Duran Jones stuff and God, so many, it could be a sit down and so many other great groups, including yourself. And so you worked with label mate Kelly Finnegan on a few different tracks. The first one I had heard is the message from the meters, which has uh-huh. almost a million streams on Spotify. Would you say that the meters is a, a huge influence on the band? And what are some of your other influences? Yeah, for me personally, yeah, definitely the meters is, is a is a huge influence. Obviously, we have a um, or we have, yeah a lar- larger ensemble and more thicker instrumentation than the meters. The thing that's great about the meters is it's a, and and like Booker T and the MGs, um, they're just like a four piece. I guess as far as some of our other influences, it would be you know of course James Brown. No no one that plays funk or soul can cannot mention James Brown and his contribution. Isaac Hayes, Curtis Mayfield. Fay Lacuti. Oh yeah, I mean all all pioneers, all legends in their own right. And I don't know, I I love that time period of music as far as uh, originality in terms of just sheer showmanship. I mean, there weren't a lot of tools and tricks. You know, there was no auto tune. You really had to be good and and know your stuff. Um, but I think also back then in the '70s, particularly '60s and '70s, um, you know, count the Motown era and stuff too. Um, they really praise the originality. They really praise like everyone having a different and unique sound. And I feel like now music has become much more ubiquitous, especially in the pop world, um, where I think it's more of now people come and say, "Oh, this this record really sounds great. Go make ten more records just like this." <laughs> where that didn't happen before. Right. And so it's always great, you know, to have groups like yourself that I feel are very original and sticking very true. So do you feel like because of those influences, do you approach uh, the recording process, um, the type of gear that you're using, like based on that vintage uh, vibe as well. Definitely, for for the most part. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna shy away from from using Pro Tools though, especially for mixing. It's way easier, you know, for what for what I have. I'm just doing it out of my my bedroom pretty much, as far as the the control room of the studio here. So um, I don't have a big mixing console. And I don't have like a mixed down tape deck or anything like that, but we do definitely use analog gear on on the front end, the Tascam 388, which I'm sure Sergio, if you if you talked about gear with him, I'm sure he mentioned the Tascam 388. He uses it as well as does Kelly Kelly Finnegan and all kinds of people. <laughs> it's a great great tape machine. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a kind of a mixture of the vintage approach with some modern tools. No, I definitely hear you on the hybrid model, especially when it comes to mixing. I mean, if you've ever seen vintage footage of how they used to cut and actually edit tape and how they cut the tape and taped it together and would splice that, I don't know if it's right. uh, a documentary. Um, but I remember, like, all of the overdubs for, for Queen Bohemian Rhapsody, like, the tape was so thin <laughs> that they were afraid to move it to be able to transfer it, I guess, onto vinyl because it was just so fragile and that medium. And, and the same goes for, um, I think, uh, Doobie Brothers when they were doing uh, What a Fool Believes. They had, you know, the editor had to cut the tape and to make the tape the way they wanted because they didn't have actually one full tape that was the way that they wanted and they didn't actually like it. So the editor had to actually physically go in and, and slice it. And I've seen, I saw when I was at school at Berkeley, they would show us like how they did that. But, I mean, remarkably... Pro Tools has been a game changer for the industry as far as people being able to mix, especially being able to mix in the box uh, versus having all of the outboard gear. So I think that's very cool. Yeah, it, you know, yeah. The, the editing, the editing alone is is just incredible. Like like you're saying, the difference between cutting tape and, and just having it on the screen and being able to to loop stuff and you know do infinite infinite takes if you want to. Definitely, yeah. I mean, you definitely have the and digitally you have the options of doing, um, you know, more takes. But do you find that you guys are usually pretty well rehearsed, that you're looking to try to lay down as much into a solid take as possible versus having to do, like, a lot of editing? That's that's usually the approach. So, I mean, sometimes we'll, we'll write some songs on the spot, and those ones will end up getting chopped chopped up a little bit more. But, yeah, for the most part, that, that is the that is the approach. Um, write the song, test it out live, and then and then record it when it's well rehearsed. So then as we backtrack through your catalog, you've done a few albums. I, I've seen you've done four 45s and two LPs. And having that under your belt, uh, including this last record, do you have a, a phase? And then where are you guys planning to go musically 
next after this album? Hmm. Do I have a favorite? I mean, I think that the newest album is, is, is my favorite. And we've got our version of Impeach the President with Kelly Finnegan coming out probably in October. So that was, that was another favorite that, that we did as well. Yeah, let's talk about that. I saw that, uh, you know, you teamed up against with Kelly. Uh, love his stuff, love his solo uh, work. He covered Honey Drippers, 1973, anti-Nixon political function, and he's the president. Do you guys usually kind of slant towards the political arena, or was this kind of the, you're trying to speak more to the time uh, by reinventing the song, reimagining it? Well, I guess it was just a, <laughs> it's pretty much the, the perfect opportunity. That That's an awesome song with an awesome drum break. And Jake is the kind of drummer that can really make that shine. Yeah, I mean, I feel like with everything that's been happening in the last four years, you kind of have to speak out. And as an instrumental group, it's hard for us to do that. I mean, besides like what I can say at shows and the names of our songs. So we've been performing it live with our, with our trombone player singing it. And Terry heard it, and he said, why don't, you, why don't you get Kelly to sing that? And uh, I love the way it turned out. That's cool. It's nice to be able to have that kind of arsenal of other people to connect with in a label situation to to work with other people. And it just kind of adds, since you guys are already doing so many cool things, I think uh, I find a lot of the time combining groups can be very, uh, very essential, not just to the marketing of it, but, you know, just to get uh, you know, fresh perspectives on it. Definitely. I agree. So I wanted to kind of talk about your mixture of vintage uh, with digital as it comes to 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 Spotify and streaming services. So I saw we're both, uh, you know, our bands are both featured on the Spotify All Funked Up and Funk Drive playlist. You actually uh, mixed my song Confident, which features your new guitar player, Lito Magana from Macizo Beat, um, mm-hmm. who's featured on the record. Um, you've also mixed their upcoming album for California Soul Music which sponsors the podcast. Uh, that's super exciting for all of us. And then I think one of the instrumentals for their playlist just got um, on the instrumental funk playlist for Kanoga Madness. So congrats for that. I mean, thanks for all your work on that. But how do you feel about Spotify and particularly these playlists as far as you reaching and amplifying to a, an audience, an audience that may not necessarily be audiophiles on vinyl, but still hip to the music uh, because they're able to consume it in a different way in the digital media and the streaming. Sure. Um, I, that's what I think for me. Um, I guess I'm kind of a Luddite <laughs> in my in my opinion here, but for me, I, I guess I consider that Spotify is the new radio. It's mainly for as far as what I consider the purposes to be advertising and, yeah, and gaining new listeners. It doesn't pay a lot of money but I guess it's better than paying money to advertise. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it attracts new, new listeners. Um, but I, but I come from working in radio, so I'm, I'm a bit sad to see that medium kind of go away and be replaced by automatic automated playlists, even though they are curated by someone, there's no personality like like what, what like what you would have with KEXP or KCRW with someone on the air live in the chair playing music you know it's, it just lo- loses a little bit of its uh, community feeling to me but like you said I, I do think it is good for for advertising and, and attracting um, new listeners yeah that's interesting you come from a radio background I saw when the group was kind of first starting back in 2016 you were prominently featured on the legendary alternative rock station 91X in San Diego as Artist of the Month. And uh, did you feel like that kind of helped you gain some more exposure during those earlier years? Well, I, yeah, I worked for like the, for the NPR affiliate here in, in San Diego, KPBS. So they were they were real kind to us. They had us in to perform and did, did interviews each time we released an album. So that, that was pretty nice. And I, wor- I work on a, a radio show and podcast called Away With Words, which is on NPR stations across across the country. So I, I do, I have experience for that or with that and, uh, and a lot of love for, for radio as, as a medium. Oh, wow. Well, I've definitely checked out that podcast. I haven't heard it, but away with words NPR. I feel like we can check it out. That'll be very, very cool. Always happy to support and to be able to listen to other content. There's so much 
kind of out there now. And you guys, uh, before, before in a pre-COVID world, you were touring a lot. All over the West Coast, you had residencies, obviously in San Diego. You also had um, a lot of shows at the Boom Boom Room in, in San Francisco. And so kind of how is the band live versus in studio? What could fans or, or lovers of this music expect from a live show? I guess as far as a live show, we add more soloing and we add and we kind of stretch the songs out a little bit and we add uh, uh, vocals as well. So we do five or six cover songs, vo- vocal tunes over the course of a set, depending on how, how long we play. At, at, a, at a venue like Winston's in Ocean Beach, we'll, we'll play up, up to two hours, um, somewhere like the Casbah, it's more like 90 minutes. But, but you know, nine-piece nine band on stage, um, and we just, you know, pass pass solos around and try try and mix it up, try and be dynamic, you know, slow songs, fast songs. Some songs have long solos, some, some songs just uh, kind of more straightforward. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. I mean, that's what you would expect, especially from a funk band, more of a jam uh, extended part for live. I love that. I love, some of my most favorite records are live records. Uh, one of my one of my all time favorites being uh, James Brown Love Power Peace, the live at the Olympia in uh, 1971 in Paris. Uh, do you feel that your band will? Ha- I don't know if you have. Uh, do you have you cut a live record or are you planning to? Yeah, we we we've cut a live record and it's been mixed and we're just waiting for art and mastering from Coal Mine. It's been approved, so next year maybe. But yeah, it's uh, we recorded it down here. We're hosting um, these every every two week jam sessions at at a beautiful venue in Balboa Park called Panama 66. And on Mother's Day last year, in 2019, we we cut cut a live record with with video too oh wow so will they be doing kind of a a, a bundle will there be video content either coming out or i don't know if people still do dvds but somehow to be able to stream it and the audio and uh and video there's going to be a series of videos it's not going to be like a complete package of, of the whole recording what, what we did was we played two sets of our one set of music so we just basically played our 12 songs twice so we could have two two takes um because you know usually when when bands make a live album they do it over a series of, of a few nights and they'll have a few different takes to choose from so we did since we didn't have that option we just uh played the same set back to back twice live to me is always fun it's just like a kinetic energy especially having everybody all at once playing then having to do it kind of in sections depending on studio space and other stuff like that so being the uh, the the organist of the group. Kind of what is your what are your kind of organ influences and kind of how what are your actual like origins or, or beginnings? What's your origin story? Uh, my first keyboard influence was Money Mark of the Beastie Boys. <laughs> nice. Um, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting first person, but I could see how that could happen based on the timeline of when you were growing up. Yeah, I grew up in the in the L.A. suburbs. And I heard "So What You Want," and well, I mean, well, I guess before that, I was I was taking classical classical piano lessons, so I was more of just learning the math and theory of it all. But I was I didn't really have like much of a an artistic approach because I was like you know nine nine to twelve or seven to twelve years old. So then when I was eleven, I heard "Money Mark" of the Beastie Boys, and I was like, "What is that? What is that organ sound with the scrambled?" sound you know the sound of, of the leslie speaker going on on fast mm-hmm. so so that that kind of captured my imagination and then you know digging in, into some of the beastie boys albums in, in middle school and, and high school heard the the world electric piano and the clavinet and and then of course on on money mark's uh solo record mark's keyboard repair there's like a bunch of different synths and other organs that he's playing on there so that that kind of really really grabbed a hold of me and then um hearing san diego group the gray boy all-stars and then dj gray boy the kind of the acid jazz that he was producing and then that was kind of my bridge into the older music you know through the beastie boys root down discovering jimmy smith and then through other hip-hop like wu-tang clan and and tribe called quest and the and the far side kind of 
going back and, and seeing where where those samples came from, introducing to a lot of soul jazz stuff, especially with, with the tribe tribe music, some, some Lonnie Smith samples, Reuben Wilson, other stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's very interesting. I always tell my students and other people, you have to kind of go back through the samples, through the influences as far back in the musical timeline as you can, because, it, it, you know, if you listen to just what it is in the sample now, you're only getting just a snippet, really, of like a full song and so many tone colors and other things. But I definitely have respect for the history of the music, respect for the Beastie Boys, especially. They did an album where they they actually went and learned instruments and started playing kind of the stuff that they were doing. And I thought that was cool um, in the hip hop realm to be able to, to take the time to actually become quote unquote musicians from, from rappers. So I thought, I thought that was very interesting. I definitely grew up around that same time period and remember just a lot of the hip hop that was coming out. And for me, the mid, the mid to late nineties and early two thousands and, and yes, I, I dig the crates and everything to kind of hear the original samples. At least now with digital, we can, you know, at our fingertips find who samples who and listen to the original. Before, I mean, when I was studying music in the late 90s, early 2000s, you had to kind of go to like a library to listen to stuff. There, there were, it was like, I think Napster was kind of just starting, but it was a while before we would have YouTube and other things that we could just pull it up. But I think it's right. a lot easier for people to understand and find these things now. Yeah, we I definitely put in a lot of work in various thrift stores and record stores, um, buying records based on the cover because, you know, there wasn't like, especially at a thrift store, there's not a listening station or anything. So you just see, if you like the cover and then and then from buying other records, you start to see the peop- uh, the musicians that are, that are credited on some of these albums. And then you're like, all right, well, he sounds great on this album. Let's you know to check it out, and then you learn like as far as what your tastes are, like what what years the albums are released. You know, for me that would have been like sixty eight to seventy three or seventy four, as far as like the stuff I was into. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I I still I think most of the audio files still dig through crates. I I just got some really rare forty five gospel records that some random record store in Chicago and Instagram was selling. And I was like, that sounds interesting. I've never heard of this group. And they were cool. They were different. And I guess they, someone had passed away and their estate kind of sold the box of these finals that had never been played. Um, oh, okay. So always interesting to kind of have those types of, of moments. Uh, so getting back to your collaboration, so you collaborated twice with Kelly. Are there more collaborations kind of coming down the pipeline? Is there anyone that you have not worked with yet? that you would like to either on your label or, or anywhere really just to kind of add to the arsenal of, of guests or features. I don't know if that's something that Surfire Soul and Humble looks to, to have, you know, more vocal features or other instrumental features, but I just was wondering if that was kind of part of what you're thinking about going forward into the future. It, it hasn't really been that much. I mean, of course there's like various side projects and, and whatnot. That's probably, where more, you know, there's going to be more collaboration out, outside of the group. But I think, yeah, as far as like working with other vocalists, MCs, that's always been, you know, because as I was talking about, you know, coming into coming into funk and soul through hip hop, you know, I'm, I'm a huge hip hop fan, especially of, of the the style that was born in the early '90s. But yeah, working with with some maybe some of those uh, MCs from from that era and other people that are kind of carrying on the tradition of hip hop music from that period. I think that's an area where we might explore. Nice. Yeah. You should definitely check out one of my friends groups called the urban renewal project. Uh, a lot of my okay. players play on that and they have uh, a good mix of vocals and, and, and rappers uh, with, uh, with the big band funk. So ensemble, I think they have a 15 piece. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Exciting, but yeah, I think that'd be cool. I'd love, I would love to hear your stuff um, with a rapper. I'd love to hear your stuff sampled. I think yeah, you got some great breaks and other stuff in there that could be really cool. And I think you know many people could discover you through many different avenues. A lot of people are putting a lot of that kind of funk soul stuff into uh, sample libraries and other stuff like that to kind of get more of it out. 
I don't know if you guys would do that, but that's just what I've been hearing around from other engineers that they're saying that's kind of a new, um, kind of like licensing is like a new extension of your music that people are looking into now. Right. Yeah. Ter- yeah. Terry Cole mentioned doing that, and I, I I was supposed to be sending him stems, but I haven't gotten on it yet. So, but yeah, that that's another another avenue that uh, that we will be exploring. Awesome. Well, I look forward to that. What is some advice that you would give as we start to uh, wrap up? What is some advice that you would uh, give to someone that was just starting out, either starting out playing keys or uh, start wanting to start their own band or um, someone uh, starting out recording and engineering? Like, What kind of advice would you give someone that was like a newbie? I guess I would say put in the time to study your heroes, people that move you the most. If it's an organ player or, or a piano player, learn their songs, like really learn their songs, learn all the, all the licks, you know, basically get, get inside their head. Um, as far as recording, um, being a recording engineer, just talk to the, your favorite engineers. They're, they're all probably really down to earth people. Most people are, are down to, to share, share the knowledge. Yeah, I would just say don't 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 be standoffish as, as far as like trying to meet other people in, in, inside the the music scene and other musicians. Everyone's really really nice. So yeah, I think that's definitely well put and well said and really good advice. Uh, so for my last question, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want to most be remembered for? Man, that that's a that's such a hard question for <laughs> for for anyone. Um, especially for for someone like myself that's really kind of honoring and heavily influenced by me, by music that's from outside of our time period. I don't know. I I would hope that that I was able to pay respect and and take the music to to new places. I think that's all anyone could really can really ask for as far as even any artist that that they pay honorable tribute to their influences and and take the art form, you know, in a in a unique way that that is their own i think that's definitely the only way to to do it i think that's a great legacy and and i'm sure that you are already doing it and will continue to do that uh, the future is too far ahead to see but it sounds like there's some really great records coming down the pipeline i look forward to the impeach the president when it comes out later this year and i look forward to that live album sometime next year um, so we'll definitely circle back to you once this is out uh, in season two of the podcast so that you have all the links and, and can listen to it. But we thank you again, Tim, for all the work you've done for us and just being a really great guy. And we really love the Surefire Soul Ensemble and the group and, and Coal Mine and wish all of you uh, the best in the future. And if there's any way that we can help or collaborate in any way, we're most certainly happy to do that. Hopefully we'll uh, be talking to you about more projects as they come in the future as well. Yeah, Cliff, I really appreciate you having me on. These are all really, really thoughtful questions here. And, yeah, definitely excited to work with um, California Soul Music and, um, you know, your music. And I appreciate appreciate the love here. Awesome. The love is mutual, my friend. Much respect to you. Um, you know, definitely we'll be keeping in touch. And I will talk to you soon. Cool. Sounds good. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. You just listened to Deeper Grooves, Musicians on Music, hosted by Cliff Beach and sponsored by California Soul Music Record Label. I would like to thank the very fun, very funky Tim Felton for coming on the program today to talk about their Coal Mine Records number one Billboard debut album, Building Bridges, fresh off their San Diego Music Awards win. I'd also like to thank our engineer, Tim Hall and 1192 Studios for mixing and mastering this recording. If you like this recording and you want to hear more, you can visit us online at www.californiasoulmusic.com forward slash Deeper Grooves. Until then, take care and stay funky.